President of the United States, surrounded by some of his grandchildren, pauses in his war tour of the nation to hold a family reunion in Texas. Then on to famous Randolph Field, America's West Point of the Air, and the entire Cadet Corps lines up for a review by the Commander-in-Chief. At another Army flying school, student bombardiers soar aloft for a demonstration of aerial precision and marksmanship, nosing their way through fleecy clouds for a final test before joining their comrades in action overseas. Over the bomb range, the target grins skyward. This is their objective, everything ready. Bombs are in racks poised for their downward screaming flight. The bombardier releases his load with split-second timing, and the result, bullseye for Uncle Sam's bombardiers. Americans march up New York's Fifth Avenue in honor of their great patriot and national hero, Count Pulaski. Adopted daughters of America and young ones born in America, keeping alive the faith, the spirit, and the traditions of gallant Poland, a Poland that will rise again. War dance in the jungle. Friendly natives entertaining United States troops stationed halfway between Australia and the Fiji Islands. Here in New Caledonia, the Stars and Stripes are carried by shock troops sent to hold this rich and strategic island for the United Nations. moving, hard-hitting mechanized units speeding into action, patrolling the 8,000 square mile outpost over jungle trails and mountain streams. Even for seasoned infantrymen, it's a constant battle against nature and the unknown. Always on the move, guarding every point against possible attack. Homecoming for a hero. Neighbors, friends, the entire town turns out to welcome the first United States Army man to win four of the nation's highest decorations for valor. Captain Alvin Muller, home on leave from war in the Pacific. The captain's mother, so proud she's breathless and very nearly hatless. The captain's father, adding his approval. Then down Main Street, Captain Muller rides with his wife. As pilot of a flying fortress, he distinguished himself in air combat in the South Pacific. Four decorations for bravery and heroic rescues under fire. And even as these scenes of happy homecoming are issued, Captain Muller is back with his command, seeing the job through. A convoy of anti-aircraft units rumbles across America's great western desert. And from out of the sagebrush and cactus, camouflage guns are revealed ready to shoot. Range finders, sound detectors spring into action. A part of the nation's long chain of coastal defense, they're always on the alert. Now, guns ready, they practice on a target towed by a plane. Against enemy tanks, anti-aircraft automatics fire point blank.
By night, batteries of searchlights sweep the sky, hot steel and tracers marking the path of death. in Rio de Janeiro, United States Secretary of Navy Frank Knox comes to inspect military and naval bases in South American waters. Brazil attaches great importance to the Secretary's visit. With President Vargas, he sees the nation's newest class of aviation cadets become full-fledged flying officers of the Brazilian Air Force. helmeted veterans, most of whom received basic training in the United States, the newly commissioned officers are ordered immediately to flight commands. Today, Brazil is turning out both planes and pilots in ever-increasing numbers. Brazil, on guard in South America. Cadet School for the future officers of America's rapidly growing merchant marine. Here, keen-eyed, alert young men master the problems of navigation and seamanship. Learn to do a sailor's job like regular men of the sea. And the crews, every day in every port, these unsung heroes of the merchant marine are signing up for service. For planes must be delivered overseas. Guns must be transported to new fronts. Torpedo boats must be sped to combat areas. And trucks, 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 the lifeline of armies must reach the theaters of war with all possible speed. Cargoes battened down on decks, each ship awaits orders for departure. In undisclosed harbors, they rendezvous, their destination known only to the commander. Now, steam up, the zero hour is at hand, and the mighty fleet gets underway. Below deck, deep in the bowels of the ship, engines throb, the fires burn high, every man is at his post. Yes, just like the army, the merchant navy also travels on its stomach. From galley to mess room, officers and men are fed the finest food ever served aboard a freighter. Blackout. They're leaving the protection of the harbor. Keen eyes must now be on the lookout for lurking submarines. Day after day, week after week, the convoys go through bringing food, supplies, ammunition, equipment to United Nations around the globe, to Australia. To England. To India. To Russia. The greatest merchant fleet in all history, America's victory fleet delivering the goods that will win the war.